Okay. Um, so the only question I had for Eric is, Eric, you used to have a Bolt and an EUV. Now what do you have? You have a Tesla too? Yes, uh, my wife still has her Bolt EV. I have sold the EUV and our 2020 was long gone. So. Okay. Yeah. Just musical cars. I don't have a problem. <laughs> Um, so, uh, welcome to everybody, um, and we've done our introductions. Um, I just wanted to call attention to some upcoming dates. Um, we have um, our EV pop-ups at the Davis Farmers Market that happen every third Saturday, and Nathan, I don't know if Nathan wants to wave, and he might want to chat about this a little later. He's looking for more um, folks who want to share their cars especially some of those new cool ones. Um, so um, Nathan, I don't know if you want to put your contact information in the chat, um, but um, Nathan is uh, helping to coordinate the EV pop-ups on third Saturdays at the Davis Farmers Market. Um, our next DIVA meeting will be August 9th, and uh, right now it's scheduled to be in person. Eugen Dunlap, who many of you know, is going to be hosting us at um, Mira Commons, which is a local community housing cooperative, housing co-housing, um, um, uh, uh, but a community, and um, will be um, uh, there in their community room. Um, but they are unique in our community as a multifamily location that has twenty of uh, twenty-four chargers, one for each of the households that live in that community. Um, so that'll be kind of fun. And then um, uh, just looking at dates, um, it's looking like our National Drive Electric Week EVs at the Pavilion event um, that we hold every year will be October, Sunday, October 1st. So now um, I was hoping that one of you uh, like Nathan or Richard or someone would like to kind of run the hot topics discussion. Um, this is a section uh, for your, our EV Curious where people just raise questions, big questions that they have, or um, sometimes there's a, a th something going on in the EV community or in the industry that people want to raise. We just, a number of you were probably at the big showcase in Sacramento this weekend. Um, so there may be some interesting things you saw or heard at that event. Um, so, um, who'd like to go first? Well, I'll pitch in because I've got a couple of things that popped up, I think are hot topics. Um, and they all address the Chevrolet Bolt. The Bolt, um, GM has just announced the Bolt's not going to be produced for 2024. So, the Bolt EV and the Bolt EUV, um, the 2023 models are the last year they're going to be produced even though there are rumors that they may bring it back in the future with different batteries and technology. <clears throat> so um, well, we'll stop production what's that? at 2024. So mm -hmm. they'll do them for 2023 and then that's it. They're that's going right. to make them now. Yep. So, um, but the other good, I guess the other news from Chevrolet is they're putting out the uh, a Chevrolet Blazer and a Chevrolet Equinox, which are going to be longer and bigger um, EVs. So those are going to be taken up this, taken up the slack. So it might mean there are a lot of bold people that suddenly buy those cars or Teslas, <laughs> and uh, there might be a lot of used bolts on the uh, ready to be bought. So that might be the other side might be good. No, so. and then. Um, the second thing I heard, which I'm sure a lot of the people have heard recently, is both Ford and General Motors have decided to use the Tesla's um, charging um, standard for their their charging devices, and they're going to be able, Tesla's going to allow the GM and Ford EV models, new models, to charge at their superchargers. So, um, it sounds to me like a big win for Tesla. So they're going to get a lot of people using their superchargers. 
not so much for Tesla owners, I guess, because it's going to be a little bit more crowded. Um, but uh, it changes the standard, though, for charging for those two makers. So <clears throat> I think all of us can see we're, we're just driving up and down the valley, all the new Tesla chargers that have been going in. So it looks to me like they've been getting ready for that reality for a while. Um, will be interesting to see um, what its impact is for us, especially in California. Yeah. Good part is it gets, <clears throat> you know, there's been a lot of discussion about the, the problem with charging stations and how so many are down, not reliable. So um, um, it sounds like this will actually, it tosses what in California, 10,000 new charger stations in California back into the mix. Mm -hmm. So that's good news. Yeah. Um, but it means the rest of us might need to get our CCS, get adapters on them so we could use the, <laughs> those uh, Tesla chargers. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not sure which one of you was first, but uh, Eric and Larry, you both have your hands up. So uh, uh, Larry, you want to go? Okay. Yeah. You know, I have a Tesla tap. Um, I have a 2019 Hyundai Kona EV. And I bought a Tesla tap when I bought my car, but I've never actually used it. Has anyone used the Tesla tap on a Tesla charging station with a non-Tesla automobile and had bad or good luck with it or what? what? Well, look, Eric is next up and he's going to answer your question. <laughs> Go for it. Okay. Thank you. What's, what's a Tesla tap? A Tesla tap is an adapter that allows you to uh, use a non-Tesla well, charge your non-Tesla vehicle with a te from a Tesla charging station. Hmm. Okay, Let's, just call it a, 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 an adapter. I never heard of yeah. a word tap before. <laughs> yeah, okay. there there are several different uh, makers of these of these adapters, but Tesla okay. tap for one. Got it. That's the brand name. Yeah. Um, oh. Eric, did you want to? Yeah, sorry, just opening my door. One second. Yeah, so regarding the charging and, and, and stuff, uh, we definitely have used um, one of the uh, adapters, like you say. I was actually just going to go fetch it. Worked great. Uh, they're, they are a little bit finicky to use in the sense that some, they, they only work on destination chargers, so they, they don't work on the actual superchargers. So it's level two or, or under which is fine. I mean, if you set your expectations, uh, but also some destination chargers uh, can be set to only talk to Tesla's. So if it doesn't work out, it may not be your unit. It might be the configuration of that charging station. Um, but I think by default, they're open to everybody. And I think the idea is you plug in the adapter, but you have to give it like a minute or right. more. Because it if it's going to try to talk talk like the Tesla language and it's going to fail, and then it's going to talk normal J1772 speak, and then it should work. <laughs> so if it fails at first, just give it some time. Okay, thanks. Uh, so Eric, if I got that right, so it's not for the superchargers, not for the fast, which is a DC fast charge. That's right. That's okay. correct. They handle, I think, up to 50 amps, which I think is 10, 10 kilowatts, uh, yeah. and. That's that's it, um, but I mean we've we've used them going to hotels and stuff because some hotels have Tesla charging and nothing else. Uh, so yeah, we can just swoop right in before that Model Three gets there. Uh, they they love it. They love seeing it. The Tesla people they're very happy when a bolts <laughs> in the spot. <laughs> that they want. That they do. <laughs> yeah, so that's a good time. Uh, but as far as superchargers going over to um, kind of opening up. I know there's a few stations uh, that have CCS uh, magic uh, docks or whatnot uh, in the country. I think only three or four sites, last I checked, have been updated with the ability to use superchargers on CCS uh, with a native CCS plug. And they are in, I think, New York and Folsom and maybe wow. SoCal now. Hmm. So there's a few in Folsom. Not Folsom, my bad. Um, El, El Dorado? Ah, it's up one in Placerville. Placerville. Placerville, yes, that one. Yeah. They're going to bleed together. But yeah, so if you feel like checking that out sometime and wanting to use a supercharger on a CCS car, Placerville. Cool. Great. Thanks, Eric. 
Um, any other folks with any other topics they want to raise? Um, things they've heard, things they've seen, um, or any questions that you have, this might be a good time for any of our EV curious um, uh, to um, just, you know, share the question, big questions that you have. Um, or if you have a question about a particular vehicle, there may be somebody in this group that, that has one of those vehicles and can uh, share their thoughts with you. Okay, well, if we don't have any more hot topics. I, um, I've got a short thing to offer. Sure. Um, as I said, I owned a BMW i3 first, and for the last two years, I've had a Volkswagen ID4. And um, maybe a month ago, I heard about the Ioniq 6. Um, and um, I thought, my goodness, what a beautiful car that is. And it looked much more attractive to me than my ID4. <laughs> Even though I've had the ID4 for two years and I still have um, one year of free charging at Electrify America uh, and, uh, and the, the car is working just fine. I went to do a test drive of the Ioniq 6. I was very impressed. And um, I considered for a while, you know, selling my ID4 back and getting the I Ioniq 6. Um, I decided no. There's still a lot of value in my car, um, but the term I used is that I was seduced. I was seduced by the Ioniq 6, <laughs> and um, I recommend it to others. I think it was, it was uh, awarded the World Car of the Year in 2023, and uh, it's a beautiful car. I think it's a Tesla rival. Tesla Model 3 rival. <laughs> anyway, that's what I have to offer. So, so John, is Richard, did you actually, you test drove it? I did, yep. Okay. At, I, in, in Sacramento. Okay. So the only thing I know about it, is, well, I know about it because I saw, I think, uh, you know, a story about it, but I think I saw an ad about it. It was something like zero to 60, one of these zero to 60 in four seconds or something like that i think that was an all-wheel drive version but uh yeah yeah it sounded like a uh advancement hey john this is rich uh could i put my bicycle in the back that's my that's my tipping point I think we had, didn't we have uh, at our last meeting a presentation on that car? Am I not wrong? Am I wrong, right, about that, Richard? Do you remember? Um, two months ago? Maybe two months ago. And we had a really good conversation yeah. about it with a new owner. So if anyone's really curious, um, they could go back to view that uh, YouTube video because um, we got a really, really good description of the whole experience. Mm. I think that was an Ionic 5, wasn't it? Yeah, I think it was. I think it was the Ionic 5. Yeah, which is the hatchback. And the yeah. Ionic 6 is uh, more of a sedan. Right, right. Same platform, though. Yeah. I still want to know if I can put my bike in it. <laughs> OK. Huh? Um, I think we're going to. Um... John, you're on mute. All right. It's stuck. Uh, John, you're muted. My, I, I don't know about the bicycle. You'd have to uh, ask that question of someone else. Um, my general feeling is any electric car is better than any gas car. They're all, they're all great cars. They really are. Um. So I think um, we're going to go from this to our um, main speaker for tonight, um, Ash Dalal, who's a, um, with Alm Electric, um, is going to talk to us about um, highlights from the Clean City Workforce Program. Uh, so um, Ash, uh, 
you're on. Yeah, I apologize if my video is not coming in clear. I'm on my cell phone at the uh, Institute for Transportation Studies uh, event here on uh, at the campus. Uh, this week was the EVS uh, Electric Vehicle Symposium number 36 uh, in Sacramento for the first time. So we had a really good uh, week of different discussions about the, the industry and the new hardware and some of the new um, challenges that the industry faces. And so it's good to see everyone is still motivated and every year the participation just gets um, bigger and bigger. So it's, uh, it's been a good event this week, but today was the last day of that. And uh, we're here today with uh, Katrina and such with the um, with the ITS event. So, yeah, so the questions today are really what's actually going on in the community. And I don't know, Chris, if you have a chance to pull up the presentation, I, of course, I didn't have my computer with me. I'm not so you, di to... you did send it to me? <laughs> <'Cause>... <laughs> yeah, <sorry. laughs> uh, hang on a second here. Maybe you can tell people a little bit of a uh, little story, a little bit about what we're we're going to be looking at. And uh, yeah. I'll, I'll look to see if I so, can find it. As we all kind of, uh, you know, get further along in the development of this technology, one of the neat uh, aspects of being in California is there's a lot of money towards uh, grants and funding to support, you know, not only the latest, greatest technology, but to also ramp up our workforce. And so we all know that this wave is not going to slow down any bit, uh, but we also realize there is a deficiency in the workforce to support this kind of upcoming wave of technicians all the way to engineers and all the way to the infrastructure side as well. So part of that uh, grant money always says, yeah, here's some money to do the latest and greatest technology, but also as a requirement, uh, support workforce development, which means training programs and, and curriculums around that. So uh, I have been in the space for about 25 years, uh, you know, doing a lot of the engineering work for propulsion systems and such. And so I was able to take advantage of that experience and provide that uh, insight for these curriculums. For, and the first um, presentation we're gonna be going over is what we call the ZEV Seed Program. And it's a sustainability and equitability uh, project that supports the low-income uh, communities and some of the underprivileged communities that you know, may or may not have too much visibility of EV technology, nor have had uh, very much integration into their, into, the, into their community as well. So we're really trying to emphasize the importance of this technology, but really provide them with the skill sets for them to look for new jobs and new career paths to hopefully get them into the seat of an EV. So the program is now uh, about, gosh, four fifths of the way through. We've had five different cohorts uh, run through this program, uh, around 20 students each or uh, roughly about 100 students total. And uh, each cohort has been um, kind of targeted to a specific group. So the first group was a, uh, the political refugees from Ukraine and, and Afghanistan and, and Russia. And also the second cohort being predominantly all women. And we had a third cohort come through with uh, folks with various backgrounds and experience levels of different industries who just really want to get more involved with, with the understanding of this market, but also what opportunities are there. And we are just about to start the fifth cohort next week, which is uh, the 18 to 25 year old group. So fresh out of school, folks who are really trying to be um, proactive in this industry, but also kind of at that fork in the road to decide what they really want to do. So it's a great avenue for us to you know, explore and really expand upon our workforce, but also create the talent that's necessary to support these up and coming jobs. And so some of the highlights that we've had from the discussions are really specific to each uh, cohort. Um, and so I have I have them now. So which one do you want me to start with? The okay, let's, let's start with the uh, the Zev seed one, please. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. Nope, it's fine. Uh, let's see. Uh, just let me. Oh. Okay, can everybody see it? All right. 
Yes, yeah, so we can go on to the next slide. Um, so yeah, we'll just talk about some brief program details and some highlights and how we are uh, moving forward as kind of the, uh, the objectives for today. But uh, if we wanna go on to the next slide here. Uh, so, you know, as I mentioned, you know, the, the, the acronym stands for Sustainable Equitable Employment Destinations. So, again, we're trying to ramp up the workforce, but also, uh, you know, really provide uh, some general insight into the industry with various applications from EVSC technicians to e, uh, EV vehicle maintenance all the way to some infrastructure as well. So we have a lot of support from uh, local groups from SMUD, uh, Air Quality Management District, and uh, some of the local um, uh, resource centers that support the uh, underprivileged communities in the Sacramento area. So the program itself is funded from various entities and grants from the Department of Energy and some of the California state initiatives. And it is composed of both classroom and hands-on training led the California Mobility Center, which is a recently formed uh, group of uh, Depot Park off of Power Inn and Powell uh, in, in, Center, in Sacramento areas. So, if you're out in the area, uh, let me know and we can kind of show what's going on over there. But here's a picture of the first uh, cohort of political refugees in the graduation. You know, the next slide, I'm not sure if you're able to play this video, but this is a KCRA uh, link to the actual news report. Let's pull up. Okay, hang on a second. I didn't I didn't bring it up with video sharing, so let me. I'm going to stop sharing and bring it up again. Huh. It's not liking the yeah. action. <laughs> well, I guess we can send the, the present chat afterwards, but uh, the link basically is just a, a KCRA news highlight that uh, showed the first graduation of the first cohorts. And so it was a really exciting moment for me, at least, to see just the excitement on the people's faces as well as you know their interest in pursuing these careers even further. So um really fun time for me but also just encouraging to see um some fresh faces in the industry and ones that will kind of get us to where we need to be in terms of support um so yeah, we can we can we can show that link maybe in the um in the chat section or maybe uh, if you want to send the presentation out afterwards that'd be that'd be awesome people can see that or just do a zev seed search online and you should be able to locate that mm -hmm. um kcra link but in the meantime, we can probably just move ahead and show some of the highlights uh, from some of the discussions that we've had. So one of the cool kind of aspects of it is uh, working with virtual reality. So folks get, you know, not only the tactical kind of maneuverability around an EV and maintenance. And so we have a curriculum set up using uh, support from Nissan and their Nissan LEAF to really show, you know, what tools are being used and give them sort of a virtual hands-on exposure to, to working on EVs as well as you know providing them with some basic insight on the tools and the the kind of things they will be doing particularly if they are interested in that sort of career field and so again the focus is of uh, career advancement and skills to uh, to move forward with um going to the next slide please and so as i described the different cohorts that are going through there's still i believe some room i, I think on this fifth cohort that's starting uh, next week but you know we do have um quite a bit of other folks in the mix you know the predominantly all women's group was very eager to learn more about green energy rather than just level two level one and dc fast charging and such but really what's all encompassing of that whole market and uh, just recently, we finished up the construction and electrician groups who have had, again, some previous exposure to the workforce and are just really trying to ramp up their skill set to do something new and do something more uh, forward thinking. And uh, again, a really exciting opportunity there. So we can go on to uh, the next slide. Uh, so here's some kind of highlights, uh, you know, so we uh, were leveraging some of the groups uh, resources, including the CMC. So on the bottom right corner, we have a 2012 Nissan Leaf that we were used as a demonstration tool. 
we were able to now dissect the car and and look at some of those parts and really kind of focus on the maintenance side of things you know for a 10 year old ed what's really there to look for there and kind of also supporting them with uh, a lot of my you know do's and don'ts from the industry from doing this for so long but also displaying parts and really kind of explaining what's going on in ev in comparison to what we're used to in the internal combustion world um, in order to prepare themselves for the workforce, uh, especially for those who are in the mechanics or in the kind of technician level, introductions to high voltage safety and, and some of the tools that are necessary to be there as well was also of a focus. And we finally had a small little open house in my shop in Dixon where we were able to show our four wheel drive hub dynamometer and what we do for control development, and some of the engineering efforts that we involve at, at, my, uh, at my business here in Dixon. So again, it was a cool, cool venture for everybody, but we still have one more cohort to go this next week. And um, if we wanna move on to the next slide, that will kind of uh, kind of give us a little bit more um, vision of what we have next. And so this week was a perfect example of how workforce development has been one of those overlooked items that you know, we now have to be a little bit more reactive in, in catching up to, to support you know, this wave of, of, of interest. So we're working pretty closely with California Mobility Center, Sacramento Air Quality Management District is very gung-ho on, on getting uh, a lot of these curriculums in place, working with junior colleges, as well as vocational schools and some of the universities like we are here today with UC Davis and Sacramento State, and also with Clean Start and Clean Cities. And so again, it's, it takes a village and here is the village. So a lot of good uh, support here from all everybody. And we're also working with the next project that we'll talk about with the uh, student vocational training group SAVA that provides alternative education for K through 12 uh, for different career paths. Um, but anyway, so anybody has any questions, particularly about the project, uh, Zev training at communityresourceproject.org is a great resource, or just contact me and we can um, get you in and uh, see what this is sort of all about. But um, definitely too, if there is interest or if you guys are in the area of the CMC, stop by and check out what we have there. Um, so yeah, maybe we can do the uh, the next meeting. I'm sorry, the next uh, presentation there. Yeah. Okay. Does this have any videos in it? No, not. Okay. <laughs> okay. There we go. All right. So uh, the first group that I mentioned at last uh, slide there was SABA, the Student Vocational Training uh, Center here in Sacramento, which has about six different campuses across the area from the Thomas all the way to South Sac. And the goal there is to develop and actually build a lowrider EV. So we're actually taking a 1964 Chevy Paula and converting it to a full EV with my engineering support. So um, really exciting project that I wanted to just kind of tell the team about and um, show the progress as of now, which we had on display during the EVS event this week. Uh, so if we want to move on to the next slide, please. Um, so I'll give a little bit of background, some project details and kind of a brief description of our layout, um, as well as our upcoming schedule on this, which is uh, continually changing just due to everything. <laughs> so uh, we'll go ahead and kind of uh, talk about some of the background here. If you want to go to the next slide, please. So this is a lot of um, a lot of text here, but basically the goal here is to not only uh, attract the you know lower income communities the and a lot of the underprivileged communities to uh, give some perspective of you know EV technology, but also um, give them the application of something cool and unique of, of an EV lowrider. So the goal here is again to give the skill set, give the tools, but apply it to something that you know traditionally it hasn't been electrified or has been you know even thought of to be an electrified item. So again, really kind of a you know, double intent there. So to get the community involved, get them trained, but also provide them with a cool tool now to to display. I'm going to go to the next slide. Did we lose you? Nope. Uh, nope, we're here. Um, okay. Yeah, we're right here. 
uh, yeah, so here's kind of an example. On the left is our brand, actually not brand new, but restored uh, 1964 Impala. I think when I originally set to start this project, I said, well, give me the crappiest car you can find so we can hack it up and, and start, you know, manipulating some of the uh, uh, areas like the floorboards and such for potential battery packs and such. But uh, instead, they gave me the nicest car that now <laughs> is a little bit of a challenge to work with. But ideally, what we see on the right is what is now going to be the result of this vehicle. So that isn't the actual vehicle itself, but a lot of custom detail, all the chrome will be engraved. We have a lot of different folks in the, in the area supplying us with suspension as well as some of the actual hardware for the hydraulics. But um, really, again, takes a village to build this. And so we have a lot of folks in the Lowrider community helping with this to, again, blend both worlds with on the engineering side, as well as the execution side. Just want to, Move on to the next slide, please. So again, uh, kind of a, an eyeful with uh, information in there, but basically we have, you know, uh, like most of the upfitters who do conversions using crash Tesla parts or some other parts on the market, we're actually doing a lot of engineering work and providing that skill set to the kids. So everything from 3D scanning of the frame all the way to MATLAB and Simulink to provide them with the engineering side to predict and to understand what capacity and power needs there are for the vehicle based on loads. And again, giving them perspective of what I've been doing for the last 25 years of the engineering. So bringing that down to the level where K through 12 folks can actually perform this and you know set up a system for them to move forward with that will provide them the skills to potentially do more conversions or add to the curriculum there. So some of the highlights um, are um, a motor that was supplied by a company called Cascadia Motion, which is a spot off of Borg Warner, very large uh, gear company of, um, for the last hundred so years and now is now in this low volume market. And uh, coupled with a lot of the traditional hydraulic suspension items, and pumps and such, but also an upgraded stereo that uh, will now be powered by a very high power output DC to DC converter, which was normally done through various additional lead acid batteries and a large alternator that was engine driven. And since the engine is not there, uh, again, using power electronics to, to complete the, uh, the power loads there. Uh, for AC and power steering, we are actually using some used parts from a Chevy Bolt, and I think so we are only using those parts because of the fact that there really isn't anything on the market for uh, integration parts like that. So we're leveraging Chevy parts on a Chevy, which is pretty cool. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of the, the overall intent there, but if you want to go to the next slide, we'll kind of get into more technical detail, um, which we can kind of breeze through also. But Here's some of the highlights of some of the images that we see. So the top corner is the DC to DC converter. So that's the one that's actually producing up to 300 amps at 12 volts. And the bottom photo there is our level two uh, charging system that gives us about 11 kilowatts of, of charging power. Uh, unfortunately, there wasn't anything on the market for DC fast charging, nor do we have um, the solidified source of our batteries quite yet. We're in, in talk with a few different companies right now to get a call of solutions, but as in the upcoming slides here, we have a little bit more to, to think about because of the fact that this vehicle is under so many vibration loads and harshness from the suspension itself. So we want to go to the next slide. Uh, Ash, you're breaking um, up a little yeah. bit, but just to... oh, okay. Yeah, I'm realizing my phone's at like 5%. <laughs> uh, so here's just a picture of, of, of the controller that we're using. So this, is, again, is an OEM grade solution rather than uh, some uh, run of the mill uh, solutions that we're seeing out there. This is a lot of the functional safety that the automotive industry uses. So things like, hey, what happens if I spill my coffee on, on, the, on, the, on the Prindle switch? Or what happens if I press the brake and the accelerate at the same time? Um, a lot of these little features, you know, aren't normally uh, accounted for in some of the control solutions on the market today. So we have a custom solution that is more tailored for the automotive side that uh, we're leveraging in this case. And so here's a picture of that. Uh, if we go to the next slide, um, get into a little bit more detail. So here's kind of the layout of the X frame of the vehicle. So we are basically reinforcing a lot of these frames to accommodate the hydraulics and some of the loads that are imparted on these vehicles. So if we want to take a look at the next slide there, I think we have a little bit better view of where the layout of the hardware is going to look like. So we are basically using the front area of the vehicle for the power electronics as well as the gearbox and motor sort of in the transmission area. 
in the rear setup with the stereo and the hydraulics where they traditionally are. So there's kind of a, a real rough schematic of what everything's going to be placed at there. And uh, if I'm going to go to the next slide. Uh, so like I mentioned, we're using a lot of math or physics-based simulation to provide us with the insights on how to tune and calibrate the system, but also give some top-level system performance. And so MATLAB and Simulink is a, a graphical user interface that is a mathematics-based software package that the industry uses pretty heavily you know, for these predictions. And so we're able to characterize and really replicate the physics behind a lot of the, the, the equipment that's used, including the electric motors and batteries, apply real-world testing data to these to get somewhat as close as possible results of system performance and so we're able to see how much range we're getting how much length or how much time we're going to be driving with on certain speeds and whatnot so we can characterize these vehicles under certain duty cycles and really get a better perspective of how the system will perform and scale accordingly so that's kind of what the the jumble of lines looks like over there i'm going to go to the next slide so here's kind of some output of what we were looking at in terms of our physical uh, performance and what some of the gear reduction loads look like. So anticipated speed of this vehicle will be about 80 miles an hour. And because of the torque curve of this mortar, you know, we have quite a bit of acceleration, which is beneficial to us, but we suffer at the top end. So unlike most vehicles, which opt for kind of a higher gear ratio, we want the lowest gear ratio so we can leverage that torque curve and some of the higher RPMs of that engine or that motor, I should say. So the motor in this case is about a 12,000 RPM max versus, you know, three to 4,000, which was the stock 327 V8 that the car came with originally. So here's just kind of a quick summary of the, the performance that we're expecting to see there. If you wanna to go to the next slide, please. Um, here's, I think, with uh, another gear ratio. So again, we're trying to decipher what we are now going to be accounting for in terms of the auxiliary loads. So the stereo and the hydraulics are going to be definitely big loads on the system. We just want to make sure that they're accounted for. So we will, you know, compromise in some range, but we'll potentially have the creature comforts that this vehicle is known to have, you know, in this market. So here's just another example there, but I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, more more data there, sorry. <laughs> Next slide. <laughs> um, so one of the challenges is, of course, the suspension. So we do have a YouTube video that you can see, but if you do any search for lowriders, you'll see how intensive some of these vehicles can be and how much reliance there is on stiffness and rigidity of the frame. So because of that, you know, we have to reinforce a lot of these areas to now uh, be uh, tolerant for a lot of these vibrations that could damage bidet batteries. Batteries don't like to be shaken uh, very much. So we are working pretty closely with a few manufacturers and, and actually providing some of that data to them. So if we wanna to go to the next slide, uh, we can actually see uh, what the system response looks like from some of these actual movements. And so we actually had a potentiometer on a few vehicles to replicate what is seen on the X, Y, and Z axis and provide them with that vibration data to fully analyze to make sure that the batteries are tolerant of these operations you know during any shows or any events or any sort of public display of the vehicle here so trying to approach this with an engineering mindset but also providing them with the relevant data that's unique to these days in this market if i go to the next slide please and so yeah so the schedule you know we like i mentioned our goal actually was to have the vehicle done by this event uh, but unfortunately because of the supply chain because of some other issues uh, we are kind of delayed a bit, but we're looking for October 1st right now, but we are still in the process of building the curriculum, getting the students more engaged and getting them involved. And so right now they have done a really good job of tearing the car apart. And now as the summer approaches, really trying to take advantage of the students that are there to uh, potentially work on the remaining bits and pieces, but also work on a closed system trailer that is going to be used to haul this vehicle too. So multiple projects and uh, multiple kind of uh, avenues for students to explore for career potential. So here's just a picture of the actual student facility at Sava in Sacramento, where the vehicle is um, predominantly gonna be placed, but also where it's going to be fabricated and a lot of the uh, activities gonna be going on with the students there. So um, I think that might be the last slide there, but uh, I wanna go into the next one there. Yeah, that's it. 
So, um, yeah, so that's kind of the fun stuff in the community right now. Um, again, I'll keep everyone updated as we move forward on the, on the lower end project, but if anybody has any questions, we'd be more happy to answer before my phone dies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, did anyone have uh, uh, any questions? It sounds like a great, it's exciting to see both uh, both the things that you were describing, both the training programs and, and this, um, this project um see all those new faces learning new things and uh, you know i think we all can see how how many more people we need in the industry working um at all levels so that's that just exciting for especially our area um to have all that training going on here um and then um october 1st would well, that would mean that you might be able to bring that car to the EVs at the pavilion. It would be really fun to have, you know, it featured at an exhibit. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, I get my act together to actually have the open house of that uh, for our group um, at the shop. Um, you can definitely see it there as well, too. So, it's going to make it a uh, couple rounds right now. Uh, but uh, when it comes back, hopefully, I can, like I said, get my act together to get everyone over there to uh, see it all come together. Great. Thanks, Ash. We really appreciate you taking the time tonight. Um, to share all this information with us and say hi to all our friends at ITS uh, yeah. <laughs> that you're hanging out with tonight. Um, and I uh, look forward to seeing you soon. Sounds okay. good. Yeah. Uh, leave Ash, before, I got a question uh, for you. For you oh, wait. Um, yes, Ash. Yeah. I just ahead, a, this is Richard. I got a question for you. Yeah. Um, which just didn't pop in my head until you talked about two presentations. So the first one, the training, I guess you've got it open now for youth i get 18 to 25 it looks like and what what's that focus on again is that because it looked like each one was um dealt with different you know different parts of ev technology yeah. or information yeah, that's so. a good question so you know what i've actually had to do is tailor the program so the base curriculum was giving the fundamentals of electric vehicles and that starts off with uh, understanding of the variations like plug-in hybrids versus regular hybrids, EVs versus internal combustion engines, and so really trying to define what those acronyms look like. And then also tapping into the current strategies for charging, level one, level two, and DC fast charging, and what those look like from a utilities perspective, as well as the impact on the vehicle itself. And so really providing the top level of the EV side of things uh, without too much divulgence into the uh, the engineering side. So really just skimming the surface on what is um, commonly known for us EV owners, but not so much for those who don't. So really providing that basic skill set there. Um, as we progress into the hands-on side, that's where also we are now still tailoring a lot of these programs. And so one of the fun projects for the um, women's cohort, for instance, was the development and the fabrication of an electric uh, bicycle. So they were able to get kids to retrofit some bikes at the CMC to now have their own electric bike and uh the last cohort was the one responsible for tearing apart the nissan leaf so that's where we provide a little bit more insight for those who have had some industry exposure or who are already electricians or have some background to them already so a lot of skill sets there but basically the curriculum and the coursework is predominantly just the basics of of the ev world all right thanks okay. ash oh and is there a link you have in case i want to send that to somebody yeah, I believe there is a couple of links, but um, if you want, I can, uh, if you always want to check out Community Resource Project, and um, they will have more information about this program and some other future coming programs as well. Okay. I think I, I can grab it and drop it in the, um, uh, chat. In the chat, too. Thanks, Ash. So... Um, I, I have a question for Ash also. Um, do you link, you know, I, I don't know that, what is the training for the Tesla um, employees, you know, the Tesla people that, you know, all of this has been brand new. Do you link it all with um, their training programs? Um, not necessarily. I think the basics that we cover are more general because of the fact that when you talk about specific companies like Tesla or Ford or GM, a lot of their proprietary information, a lot of their specific information is unique to their mechanics and such. And so they really don't divulge a lot of that. But 
what I can do as uh, as instructor is at least provide them with the basics of what to look out for in any case they do approach either a Tesla or a Ford. So what we provide here is really more of a general, um, unlike the, uh, the companies like Tesla and such that provide, you know, their own technicians with their own training. But um, the basics that we provide are probably what they also provide too, like way at the get-go. But uh, what we do is, again, kind of generalize it from a more uh, bigger perspective rather than unique to each uh, specific car company. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Well, if there aren't any more questions for Ash, um, I think we'll go on to our uh, next item, which is really just um, time to answer questions. Um, and this is especially a uh, time for anyone who is uh, curious about um, purchasing an EV, is trying to learn more, has any questions about charging, um, you know, anything like that. Or if any of you have any additional hot topics, um, we are not going to have any other presentations uh, tonight. So, um, and we've got about 10 minutes left in our time, eight minutes left in our time. So especially any of you who are new to EVs, um, if you came with a question on your mind, we um, there's lots of really great expertise in the room tonight if, you're, um, if you have a question. I have a question about the general cost of, um, of uh, charging, you know? Um, because we have we have four electric vehicles or three electric um, plus a, a hybrid a Volt, the Chevy Volt, a 2018. Um, our bills are pretty high. PG and E um, would send us these comparisons and say, "Oh, you're boy, you're using a, so much more electricity than other people in the same area." They don't realize how many vehicles we have, but it. There's still a question for me is, what's the most economical way to charge um, your Tesla? We're doing the, you know, the midnight, we're on electric vehicle rate, but I still have this question. I don't know um, if we're, I'm optimally using all that's available to me. <laughs> So you're on the PG&E's, um, I forget what they're called, but like the EV specific plan? Yes. Um, well, I think what you're doing, like I, if it starts, if your lower EV rate starts at midnight or um, yeah. at 10 p.m., I mean, that's, that's always going to be the cheapest okay. and best for the yeah. grid. Is there any information about um how much it costs per what kilowatt hours to charge uh i haven't seen a pg e bill in a long time but my parents have pg e and i know on their paper bills it'll tell them kind of what how many kilowatts they pulled at which tier and what the pricing level is for that tier now of course the tiered rate and the time of use rate are different if you're mm -hmm. on the EV plan you're going to be on the time of use rate but it I would be surprised if it wasn't broken down in, in some capacity yeah. as far as which time of like time of time of day you use and what the price per kilowatt hour is. Yeah. No, okay. I no, I have all of that. I guess mine is a just more global kind of an issue. Um, because PG and E just keeps on increasing. But no, I know all of all of that because it's barred, you know, the bar ch charts and so forth. Um, but it's not always that e easy to, to know uh, and figure out kind of what the future is going to be. And then how do you compare with how much you're saving that, but they are giving you how much um, <clears throat> uh, carbon, you know, the footprint and are we, uh, are we saving as a result? Um, do you have solar? Yes. We just put on a third, <clears throat> third set of solar panels. So the first set uh, after 21 years uh, was no longer um, functioning and <clears throat> certainly not at the standard of what the current uh, solar panels are able to produce. 
Yvonne, anyway. hey, yeah. hey, this is this is Kevin Hanks. Hey, yes. I will. I'll start my video. You're my neighbor, and oh, so it's perfect. really it's really great to see you. Um, oh, okay. I think. Oh, hi, Kevin. Right, right. Hi. Yeah, right. yeah. It's great to see you. Yeah, we're neighbors. She lives one block away from me. So, yes. Vaughn, I think you're doing exactly what you can do to try and minimize your PG&E bill because I'm in the same situation where I tried to do the same thing in, in reducing my, my kilowatt consumption and to only power my volt at night. So the charging starts at 11 o'clock at night. I think it, it stops like 6 a.m., is, is the, the period of time when it costs the least for us to power up. And I've got solar panels on my house as well. So I think that the energy that we're selling to PG&E at a higher rate probably is giving us a higher credit than what we're charged with to power our vehicles, you know, at night. So, you know, just from my perspective, um, I and communicating with PG&E, I don't think that we can do anything more than what we're doing, um, apart from getting more solar capacity. But I think your house has plenty of it. So I think you're doing everything to try and minimize your footprint and, and your associated costs. Thank you. We'll have to get together and chat some more. <laughs> Absolutely. Look forward to it. Yep. Thanks. I do know that some people also subscribe to the view that if they can, they sometimes will charge the cars during when 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 the sun is shining, if they have, you know, and um, so that's a different price point, although not so different um, uh, as it used to be if it's still in the morning. Um, but then you're it, it's more direct to your um, solar production. Uh, mm -hmm. And therefore, you're not technically, you know, pulling power from like a natural gas peaker plant at night or some other source at night. Mm -hmm. So as long as we have good water power, which we have lots of that this year, where um, mm -hmm. our, a lot of our night energy is coming from those sources. But um, as we get into the <coughs> summer and to higher temperatures, um, those, the, 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 those night hours will be um, powered uh, through natural gas. Uh, more than likely. So. I guess I have a thought on the uh, the charging and the cost. One way to reduce cost is to drive less. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, another thought is um, it may cost more, but uh, we all have to make some sacrifice to uh, save the planet. Mm -hmm. Maybe that come. Maybe that's that's the cost you, that that you're paying. So I think you're doing all the right things. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Trying to learn. Did we have any other questions? We have just a couple minutes left. Um, I have. Uh, sure, I Rich. have. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, when I'm uh, approached by my EV curious friends, and they talk about, well, how should we think about getting an EV? I, I urge them to look at the Plug in America website and um, the uh, uh, the PG E website that has those those web pages which talk about that. And um, I'd like to know if there's some other websites that are missing that are informative to help uh, novice or the EV curious to to um, overcome their concerns or to help them shop for an EV. Uh, you know, I can, I can help people on looking for used EVs, but um, if, if I'm missing a website out there, uh, I'd sure like to know if there's one that really is doing a good job. I, I think, um, uh, so uh, Rich, our own local, uh, utility um, uh, uh, Valley Clean Energy has now posted some um, pretty good information on and good. has a little uh, you know choose uh, cho uh, kind of log in and choose your ve vehicle kind of information. Um, I also I also think that, um, that one of our most frequent questions is about uh, charging and plug share 
is such a great yes. thing to go yes. to. Right. Um, it's That's if you right. have it, I, it's I, you know, all of us have it hopefully on our phone and you can immediately show somebody how yeah. many charging devices are um, available in our community and in the region. And it's it, it helps to really kind of. Yeah, um, I, I do. I do use that for that reason. Yeah. Um, but Nathan threw threw up a, a really um, I hadn't even thought about that. Duh. It's um, it's the um, yeah, it's the government's um, it's fueleconomy.gov. Yeah. And they give a really good you can like select different vehicles and compare um, efficiency efficiency numbers. Good. Um, which is nice. And it has information for um, the IRA tax credits, too. Great, great. Thanks, Nathan. That's that's a good catch. And Valley Clean Energy. Thank, thanks, Chris. Yeah, I think um, uh, the other thing, you know, Cool Davis has um, um, our own uh, web page that's a little <laughs> more local. It has links to all of these things on it. And we have a drop down um, menu uh, with a number of these resources. And then the other thing we've done, and then you'll find, you can find this on um uh, resources this like this on plug in plug in america site so the um you know they cover all the vehicles but also um tips on um uh, how to talk to a dealer about a car how to look for a used car um and, and um and what uh, what you should be paying attention to when you're buying a used car so we have information about the, that as well as um, um plug in america and um, and so there's uh, uh, Cool Davis, um, we're kind of Diva Lives, uh, Saki V's website and Facebook page. Um, and then I think I would also say that um, both or local organizations are really great about taking questions. So if any, somebody just wants to send in a question to our main um, email address, there's always somebody that can answer those questions in our network. Um, and uh, so we really try hard to get back to people quickly. Um, if they're looking at a, a couple of cars and trying to ca compare them and they want some opinions about some questions they have, there's usually somebody out there who, who has time to answer, so. Great, that helps. Anyone else? Jerry. Yeah. Yeah, let me just chime in on Richard because he was asking about putting a bicycle in the back of a car. Um, there's another option that I'm using. Um, for me, getting the bicycle in the car is kind of clumsy. So what I did was I actually had a trailer hitch installed on the back of my car. My bicycle weighs about 70 pounds because it's an electric bike. And so I had a two inch a receiver put in on the trailer hitch. And then I have a um, bike rack that I plug into the trailer hitch. So when I'm going on a bike ride, I put it on the back of the car. The rest of the time is just in the garage. So it, it's kind of easy on, easy off. And that way you don't have to worry about the uh, getting it in and out of the car, or even if the car has enough room for your bike. Just my two cents. <laughs> That's a good one. I was th I was thinking more of my, my 10 speed Schwinn, but, but yeah, the, a, a rad EV bike, uh, might be a challenge. I like the trailer idea. Thanks, well, Jerry. Yes, thanks, Jerry. Um, I like, you know, talking about bikes is an important thing in, in the Davis crowd. Um, and so, and that, you know, this, the EV, the e-bike all the way to the biggest car. And it, it's a really interesting portfolio that some people are starting to assemble in their garages. Um, Nathan, I'm wondering if you would like to make a pitch at all for um, uh, Saturdays at the market. Oh yeah, um, I, I'm Nathan. I help run the Diva market pop-ups that we do every third Saturday of the month. So we go Diva and then also Cool Davis volunteers um, at the Davis Farmers Market. Every third Saturday, we have a different EV from one of our DIVA members, um, show up the markets, um, answer questions from anybody, talk about what we do, talk about DIVAs, see if they wanna sign up. Um, the market runs 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. and then we just ask uh, 
people who are volunteering their cars to show up around 7.30, 7.45. And so the next one is this Saturday, um, June 16th. Right. And I think uh, you, well, you could probably drop your information in the chat again uh, for anybody who came a little yeah. later in the, in the evening. Um, like I said earlier, um, our next uh, DIVA meeting will be in person, hopefully in a hybrid mode. We will be trying to Zoom people in who can't join us in person, um, but we will be at um, your Commons, which is a local co-housing community, um, and they have on site 24 individual chargers, one for each household uh, um, in that co-housing community. And it's kind of a, a unique thing that our dear friend, uh, Eugen Dunlap uh, managed to um, manage to get PG&E to do. <laughs> Was a kind of remarkable thing at that moment. Um, so uh, we're really glad that you could all join us today. Um, and we hope you'll join us again for our meeting in August. And in between, um, we will be doing continuing with the EV pop-ups on uh, third Saturdays. Um, and you're welcome to come even if you're not bringing your car. We'd love to have other EV owners out who are willing to talk with people about um, uh, what they know and um, uh, want to share, whether it's on char charging or the kinds of common questions that we get from the general public. Um, and then... Um, we're looking a little further down the line, you'll be hearing from us about planning for October 1st, um, National Drive Electric Week. So thank you all. Yvonne, you get the get the long distance award again. <laughs> zooming in from Jamaica. <laughs> Glad we, we could see we could see you. Good. Same here. I won't make it in August because I think we'll be in Dubai. <laughs> so and that'll be a different time zone as well. Yes. <laughs> Fun. All right. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you all. Hey, Nathan, you want to? Oh.